Um, well, um, I don't know whether people in the audience have been to my other talks, but if they haven't, I'll briefly situate this lecture in what I've been doing in this series here. Um, I've been presenting some features of cognitive linguistics, um, um, some important trends, and some applications to the description of certain uh, aspects of English. Um, the topic today is some aspects of English nouns and noun phrases, or nominals. Um, I'll be looking at some of the st well, structural properties of nouns and noun phrases and nominals, um, and also at the semantic conceptual basis for the various distinctions. So, in fact, my talk is going to be rather, rather structuralist, in fact. <laughs> um, it's dull. Now, the um, aspects of the now noun phrase in English, which are perhaps somewhat problematic for foreign learners of English, include a number of aspects. Notoriously difficult is, of course, the use of the various articles and determiners. Um, actually, I won't have so much to say about that. If I was to speak about every aspect of, of noun phrases, I mean, I would be here all day. Um, so I won't have very much to say about the use of articles, although I will say a few things about that. Um, but I want to focus in particular on the classification of English nouns as so-called count and mess, and the various consequences of that, and the conceptual basis for this. Um, so I would think what cognitive linguistics would contribute to this particular topic is to actually look very carefully at the meanings that are involved in certain structural distinctions. Okay? And by looking at the meanings that are involved by the choice of count mass or whatever, thank you very much, uh, by looking at the meanings are, that are involved, um, this will give some idea of why certain structural distinctions are made. If you understand why something is as it is, then it becomes easier to learn. Right? Uh, so to have some idea about the conceptual basis of a distinction, that makes the distinction easier to learn. It makes sense to you. You are, simply, you, you are not simply learning some arbitrary facts. Okay. Um, first of all, let me just think, let me uh, explain some of the terminology here, noun and nominal. In fact, the terminology is somewhat confusing. Um, But clearly one has to distinguish between noun as a kind of word, a noun as opposed to a verb, and what is traditionally called a noun phrase, that is the syntactic st structure. So it's not, so I, I'll make the distinction between the noun, which is a kind of word, and a nominal, which is a kind of phrase. So you would say that an, that, that an English sentence has at its, as its subject, not a noun, it has a nominal as its subject, as a noun phrase as, 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 as its subject. Okay? So that's uh, an important distinction. A noun is a kind of word, so the word dog is a noun, but the dog is a nominal, a noun phrase. Okay? Um, so nouns are those words which are listed in the dictionary, if you like, but noun phrases are those expressions or nominals which function as subject of a verb, object of a verb, and so on. Now, um, and of course, in some cases, um, the noun and noun phrase might be the same. Water boils at 100 degrees centigrade. But the subject water, a single word, which is a noun, is also the nominal or noun phrase. Now, I'll use nominal and noun phrase as the same, actually. Um, Okay, um, now the distinction then between a, a noun and a noun phrase, what is, the, what is the conceptual, the semantic distinction? We would say that a noun, a bare noun, like the word 
dog or cat or house as the noun without determiner, without article, without adjective or whatever, designates or refers to a type of entity. So the word dog, what does the word dog refer to? In, in itself, a single word, dog, what does it refer to? It does not refer to a dog. It refers to a kind of thing, right? A type of animal. So the bare noun without adjectives or article refers to a type of entity. A noun phrase refers to an instance or instances of the type. Um, so, we would, uh, so to repeat once again, we would say the word house means a kind of thing. Right? A class, a type of thing, a category of thing. Whereas the house, a house, some houses, refers to examples of this particular type. Okay? Um, and you refer to these instances or examples, especially through the use of the so-called determiners or articles, the, a, this, that, and so on. Um, uh, yes. Okay, um, and in fact there are a number of grammatical devices which are used here. Um, I'll distinguish between... Um, do we have a piece of chalk? Yes. Um, basically between... Oops. Determiners, or sometimes called articles, which is... etc. And the other kind of expression that you use to refer to examples of the thing are the so-called quantifiers. And these are words like, you know, etc. In other words, the quantifiers tell you how many and how much. And the determiners, well, let's look at the determiners. Um, important here for the distinction between the and a as the two most important determiners or articles, um, that has to be understood actually in terms of the relation of speaker and hearer. You would talk about, you would use the definite article, the house, to refer to an example of the category house. And the important point here is that the speaker has a particular example of the category in mind and expects that the hearer also can identify that particular example. For example, if I say, I bought the house, Okay? That only makes sense if there is a certain house that I bought and I expect that you know which house I am talking about. That house we saw yesterday, well, I bought the house. So, the hearer is expected to be able to identify which house I am talking about. In the typical situation, um, the referent, that is, what the expression refers to, the referent will have been already mentioned in the text, in the conversation, in the discourse. Either that or its identity is clear from the context, or the speaker in fact might actually give a description of the thing, a definite description which actually um, specifies which one. So the house where I grew up, right, the house where I was born, whatever, the house we saw yesterday, the house that I used to live in, and so on, the relative clauses actually serve to identify that particular house, to uniquely identify. There's only one possibility. Okay? Now, um, what we are dealing here with is, as mentioned here, the notion of reference. The noun phrase refers to something. It refers to the example and the instance. And we would distinguish, well here we've been talking about definite reference, that is why the is referred to as a definite article, and the 
meaning of the definite article, if you like, the um, semantic effect of using the definite article is that you convey that the thing you are talking about can be identified by the hearer. Okay? So if I say to you, I bought that house, I bought the house after all, and if you don't know which house I'm talking about, you, you would have to say, well, what are you talking about? Huh? It wouldn't make sense. So some cases, what you are talking about is clear from the context. I, I say, you know, um, switch the lights on. Well, the lights, well, obviously, the lights in the room where we are sitting, obviously. Now, <clears throat> That is then definite reference. The is a definite article. If you look at the indefinites, you have a house. I bought a house. What that means is, obviously, there is a certain house, and I bought it. But I do not expect that you know which one I am talking about. So the speaker knows which house was bought. The hearer probably doesn't. So that's indefinite. You don't know which one I'm talking about. Specific, because there is a certain house that I bought. But if you take the third example, you need an egg for this recipe. Right? To make this cake, you need an egg. Which egg? Any egg. Right? I'm not talking about any particular egg. Any example of the category egg is okay for this recipe. Okay. Um, look at these two sentences and can you see the difference in meaning? He wants to marry a rich woman. He met her at the casino. He wants to marry a rich woman, but he hasn't found one yet. The point about these two examples is that the expression a rich woman is different in two cases. It's different with respect to specific and non-specific. Um, Okay, he wants to marry a rich woman, he met her at the casino. A rich woman here is specific. He wants to marry a rich woman and here she is. Um, he wants to marry a rich woman, but he hasn't got one yet. In other words, in the first sentence, a rich woman refers to a certain individual who is rich. You don't know who she is, but you know, she exists. In the second case, um, he wants to marry a rich woman when he finds one. It does not actually refer to any particular individual because he hasn't found one yet. Right? It could be anybody. Um, and notice another difference here is the um, pronoun you use. He met her, but he hasn't found one. So her refers to this woman. One refers to any one when he finds her. This is taken from my book on cognitive grammar, actually, um, but illustrates the kind of determiners that you have. You have the definite, which is the. This and that are also definite, of course. Indefinite, which is typically a. But a, like a rich woman, is actually ambiguous between specific and non-specific um, reference. Okay. Let's go back. Um, let me see. Okay, so you have the three kinds of reference. Well, definite, indefinite. Indefinite becomes specific, non-specific. There's also a th another kind of reference when you use the noun phrase to refer to things. This is the so-called, um, which is actually, actually rather more difficult and rather interesting, so-called generic reference. That is, when you are referring not to an example of something, but you are referring to the whole category. 
right? Where you're making a generic, a general statement about this kind of thing. And in English, in fact, there are a number of different ways of doing generic reference. A typical one is to use the noun in the plural. Cats are carnivores. A carnivore is an animal that eats meat. Right? Cats are carnivores. Cows are not carnivores. So a carnivore is a meat eater. Okay? Cats are carnivores. That is a general, generic statement about cats. It's a property of the species. Right? And one way of doing generic reference is you simply put the noun in the plural. And that kind of makes sense because the plural noun refers to, well, all examples. But um, generic reference is interesting because uh, cats are carnivores. Is that true? Well, yes. Cats are carnivores. But suppose that your cat doesn't have teeth and can't eat meat, can eat only milk. Suppose your cat is a vegetarian cat. Um, does that mean that this generic sentence becomes untrue? Well, probably not. Okay, generic sentences are interesting because they make a statement about the category as a whole, which is sort of in general true. You can have exceptions. Right? Um, and um, possibly one reason for that is that with generic sentences, you are actually not talking about actual examples, you are talking about a sort of, um, what shall I say, a sort of ideal, simplified world, right, which is in general true of the real world. So a typical way of doing, uh, making generic reference is by using the noun in the plural. Another way is actually, the, the, the second one, can you see that? Is that uh, anyway, is by using the indefinite article. A zebra, or zebra, has stripes. You know a zebra? Okay, so a zebra has stripes. Um, or zebras have stripes, plural. What you're doing there, a zebra is indefinite. Um, how can that have generic reference? How can that be a statement about zebras as a kind of animal? Well, one explanation is that if you say a zebra, you are referring to, the expression actually refers to any example that you care to choose, any example of the category, and that example that you take is taken to be representative of all of them. So what you say of one is true of them all, basically. Um, so, a zebra has stripes or zebras have stripes. Now, another way of um, doing generic reference is actually with a definite article. Um, the dodo, that was an animal that lived in, it's a bird, wasn't it? That lived in uh, Mauritius somewhere, somewhere, yes, which is an extinct animal. Um, the dodo is extinct. Dodos are extinct. Notice that the three kinds of generic reference are, in fact, a little different. You can't say a dodo is extinct. Um, so generic reference actually is quite interesting. Um, um, and notice that there is actually no special way of making generic reference. You simply make use of other devices, plurals, a and the, and so on. OK. Um, Okay, so that is um, a few comments about one important aspect of English nouns. Or rather, English nominals. <coughs> uh, 
Um, there's actually much, much more one can say about that, because although the distinction between definite, indefinite, um, the use of a versus the, um, is more or less, as I have stated, once you get down to actual individual examples, there is, of course, quite a lot of idiomaticity and, um, I won't say exceptions, but um, all sorts of special cases, shall we say. But I say there's no time to go into all of that. Um, the next topic I want to look at, some next important aspect of the English noun phrase, is the question of number, singular and plural, and the distinction between count nouns and mass nouns. Um, these topics, of course, are likely to be of interest to people like you because Chinese doesn't really have the category of number. You can't make a noun plural by sticking something on the end of it. Um, but absolutely, absolutely central to the grammar of the English noun phrase is, in fact, the question of number, singular and plural, and the use of singular and plural depends on the distinction between count nouns and mass nouns. Um, it's not just a conceptual distinction, it is actually there in the grammar. Right? It's an essential aspect of the grammar of noun phrases. Uh, are we? Yes. So, so absolutely, absolutely important in English is the distinction between count nouns and mass nouns. And I'm sure you are familiar with the concepts and I imagine with the terminology. Count nouns are nouns that you can count. Boy, television, chair, house, etc. Mass nouns, things like music, rice, water, furniture, air, and so on. Now, the distinction between these two. Well, we can actually look at the distinction in two ways. We can look at the grammatical or structural distinction, and we can also look at the semantic and conceptual distinction. And, of course, you have to look at them both. Yeah, I mean, you have to look at them both. Now, the grammatical distinction, or if you like, the structural distinction, has to do, well, I've used the nice structuralist word, distributional. That is to say, the distinction between count and mass has to do with the kinds of words they occur with. Now, the, the grammatical properties. Um, and the distinction between count and mass uh, is crucially determines the use of both determiners and quantifiers. <coughs> um, <coughs> we see if I can find... Well, I need to write it on the blackboard. No. Jesus, that works very well. Um, can, is that visible? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll go through it. Um, what I've done here, this is, <coughs> this is um, pretty standard sort of stuff, but let's go through it. <coughs> to illustrate the distributional oops, aspects. Um, can you hear me, or must I walk around with this? Um, anyway, um, what I've got here, I've got three kinds of nouns, count nouns and mass nouns, boy and air, and I've distinguished singular count and plural count, boy, boys, and air. Okay? If you look at the, the distribution of these three kinds of words, or the the possibility of co-occurring with these various and quantifiers and so on, you get something like this. The first one, the possibility of using the noun without anything at all. Well, you can't say um, boy is here, but you can say boys. So, um, boys are... Um, what are boys? Boys are a nuisance. 
Um, but you can say air, um, okay, you, have, uh, you need air to live, or whatever. Um, so another, or a boy, another boy, you can't say a boys, you can't say an air. Some, or some more, some more boy, no, some more boys, some more air. A lot of boys, not much air. This only occurs with boy and air. These, of course, with boys. Not many boys. Three, of course, only with the plural. Um, so here you have sort of nine characteristics, nine um, distributional aspects. Um, and look at the way in which the three kinds of nouns actually co-occur with, with these. Um, the interesting thing here is that if you look at how the pluses and minuses are distributed here, what do you notice? Um, okay, the three categories are different, right? The three are different, right? The three sets are different. But if you look at the three kinds, um, which two are more similar? Right? It's the middle one and the last one. In other words, these two are much more similar than those two, or indeed those two. If you look at the second and the third column, I mean, this is the same, that's the same. One difference, two differences. Okay. But down to here, they are the same. Um, but if you look here, they're just about different all the way down. Right? So those are maximally different. Also the first and the second, first and the last, well, they are different all the way down to here. Um, so in terms of the distribution then, in terms of the distribution, their grammatical properties, in fact plural, plural nouns and mass nouns are in fact quite similar. It's the singular count nouns which are different. Which in a way is quite interesting because although that is singular and that is singular, grammatically they are quite different. Okay? In fact, if you compare the first, the first and the third column, I mean, four, these four are the same but five differences. Okay, um, right, um, um, let's go back to here, okay, so, um, the distinction then has to do with the use of, um, determiners and quantifiers and so on. Now, what is the basis for this distinction between count and mass? Um, well, the first obvious statement is to say count nouns can be counted. Right? One house, two houses. One boy, two boys. Three boys. Um, and here are a number of properties, conceptual properties, of... Um, uh, this number of conceptual properties which underlie this distinction. Um, let me see how does this work. Um, yes, I think this, this is probably better. Um, okay, let's say that in connection with count nouns, let, let us say that a count noun refers to an object and a mass noun refers to a substance, some sort of stuff. Now, the distinction between an object and a substance, let us say, uh, we can actually identify four differences. Divisibility, re replicability, boundedness, and internal homogeneity. Okay, let's see what those mean. If you take... Uh, a good example of a count noun. Let us say, take the word, I don't know, computer. Right? Um, okay, you take a computer, divisibility. If you chop a computer into two, what do you get? 
a broken computer. <laughs> However, if you take um, <clears throat> a piece of meat and you chop it into two, what do you get? You get two pieces of meat. Um, it's, the same, it's the same kind of thing. So you take your meat or cake or whatever, cut it into two, you have two portions, but each portion is still the same kind of thing. Right? Whereas if you take, say, a computer or a house or a table or whatever, if you chop it into two, you don't get two tables. Um, you guess. Now, this is, the first, this is the issue of divisibility. So with, with substances, you can divide it up into portions, and each portion is still the same thing, or the same kind of thing. Now, that is possible because of other properties, the internal homogeneity, which is a big word, which means that if you take a substance like meat, one part of it is very much the same as any other part. So homoge um, homogeneous means it's all the same. So one part is the same as another part. Right? Whereas if you take an object like a table, well, the leg is different from the top. So one part is not the same as the other part. Um, so the internal homogeneity. If something is internally homogeneous, any portion is the same as any other portion, which is the same as the whole. Um, another property, another crucial aspect is whether the thing is bounded, whether, whether it has a boundary. Now, a table has a boundary, namely here and here, um, and the boundary is part of the concept. That's why if you, half a table is not a table, whereas half a piece of meat is still, is still meat. Because meat as such is a, substa is a substance which does not, as, well, of course, of course a piece of meat has a boundary, but the boundary is not part of the meaning of the word is not part of the concept. And as an example of that, it's actually quite a, an important and perhaps rather difficult notion. If you take the word lake, okay, a mass of water, okay, now you can say a lake is internally homogeneous. One part of a lake is the same as any other part of the lake. It's water. Right? So one part of the lake is just as much water as any other part of the lake. But the lake has a boundary. That's part of the meaning of the word. If the lake did not have a boundary, it would simply be water. If you call that piece of water a lake, it means that the water has a boundary with, with the land. So the boundary is part of the meaning of the word. It's part of the concept. Okay? Um, so it's the... It, and in fact, strictly speaking, a lake is not internally homogeneous because half a lake is not a lake anymore. Because half the lake doesn't have the boundary. Okay. So the water is homogeneous, the lake is, has a boundary. And because it has a boundary, it, you, then you get the second property, which is replicability. That is, you can repeat it. You can have two of them, or three of them. Right? Um, so you have one table, two tables, three tables, put three tables together and you have three tables. Put three pieces of meat together and you still have meat. Right? And in a sense, this is, um, this is then the conceptual distinction. And one important point to make is that the distinction here between the mass and count is not actually is not a property of the th of the of the thing as such right it's a property of how you actually look at it of how you conceptualize it in fact um, um now actually if we um 
No, actually, if you go back to here, you can now perhaps see why mass nouns like air, water, and meat, why they actually are grammatically very similar to plural nouns like boys, schools, houses, people, and so on. Because if you have a group of boys, is it internally homogeneous? Well, in a way, yes, because any subgroup still consists of boys, until you get down to one, of course. So you have a great group of boys, a, a small group of them is still boys. Right? Is there a boundary? Well, if you were to say three boys, yes, because that is bounded by three. Ten, one hundred, that is bounded, one hundred boys. But if you say boys with no quantifier, actually that is unbounded. It could be any number. Right? <clears throat> so, actually, conceptually, plural count and mass are actually quite similar, conceptually. <coughs> um, now, I said that um, the, the, the distinction between using count and mass nouns, okay, it has a conceptual distinction, um, I've illustrated it on very clear-cut or very clear prototypical examples, like table is or computer. I mean that that is a count noun, <coughs> no doubt about it. Um, uh, Water is quite clearly a mass noun. Versus water, it's quite clear. I mean, counts versus mass, thing, object versus substance, no problem. <coughs> but there are many actually not so clear cases where in, in principle you could go either way. And here you notice that um, the status of a noun as count or mass is actually a sort of idiomatic fact about the language concern, about the language. If you take, for example, the word rice, in English that is mass. But if you go back to the, char to the characteristics of things versus substance, um, is it internally homogeneous? Well, yes and no. You can say yes because rice is substance is the same, but it is it is not because you can actually get down to individual grains of rice. In principle, something like rice could be singular, could be mass or count. And basically, when you get to say food substances where the individual things are quite large then it becomes count. For example, you have peas and beans. Baked beans are count nouns. Um, but rice is a mass noun. And the reason, presumably, is that individual grains of rice are actually quite small, and you don't notice them. <coughs> Whereas peas and beans and baked beans are actually quite large. So you actually think of baked beans or beans as actually lots of little individual things, whereas rice you don't. Okay? And that is, you know, it would seem is, is, is a sort of an idiomatic fact about English. You can imagine another language in which it goes differently. Right? Um, or take hair, of which I don't have much. Um, is hair a substance or a lot of things, individual things? Well, in English it is um, mass. Right? You have black hair, you have red hair, long hair, or whatever, uh, or whatever. In other European languages, which have the count and mass distinction, hair is um, 
a count noun. You have to say you have long hairs, or you're... Uh, where well, you focus on the individual things. So, so for these sort of substances which consist of lots of individual things, um, in fact, you could go either way. Okay. Um, although a particular language, well, English in our case, might prefer one particular um, solution. Okay, now, it's also important to notice that um, many nouns are actually compatible. That is, you can use them both as count and as mass. And in fact, um, you may, one might even go so far as to say that, well, this is perhaps exaggerating a little, every noun can be used as either mass or counts, given the right context. Well, that's possibly a bit too extreme. But some, here are some actually very well-known examples, like the word chicken, um, a chicken versus some chicken. The first one is count, the second is mass. How do I know? Because of the determiner. A goes with singular count, some goes with well, sum plus singular is um, mass. And the, and the difference between a chicken and some chicken is, of course, a chicken is the, is the, is the bird, right, walking around. But some chicken refers to um, chicken meat, of course, um, not the bird as such. Um, And that is actually true, I would imagine, that, that, that seems to be true actually of the names of animals and birds are count. When you refer to the meat of the animal, then it becomes mass. Uh, and not just meat actually, it would refer also to say fur. A rabbit fur would be the fur of a rabbit, but a coat made of rabbit fur, fur becomes a substance. Okay. Um, okay, in the case of chicken versus some chicken, some chickens, plural, of course, is plural count. A um, bit more difficult with things like lawn. Lawn, you know, grass. Now, you can have a small lawn. This house has a small lawn in front of it. The, the lawn is a count noun. There is a boundary. Right? But you can also say, with actually very much the same meaning, this house doesn't have much lawn in front of it. This house doesn't have much lawn. Not much lawn. And not much um, well, that is typical of a mass noun, right? Like, not much water, not much air, not much time. Um, the meaning is, is a very much the same. Um, but as I say, the difference would be that a lawn, you have the idea, this is the house, and the lawn has a sort of boundary. But not much lawn. Lawn is here, be here becomes a kind of... <coughs> a sort of kind of space with no inherent boundary. Um, and nouns which refer to actually um, you know, kind of area, kind of space, um, are a bit like that. If you take the word ocean, ocean Okay, oceans are, you know, big and vast and so on. Uh, the word ocean could be used also as count or mass. You live in front of the ocean or an ocean, right? Um, or a place where two oceans meet. Um, but then you would say you look out on a vast expanse of ocean. 
which is mess. Okay? And it would work the same with a word like desert. A desert is a kind of location, but again, uh, you are surrounded by desert. Surrounded by desert. Um, another one would be a noise. There is a noise. And here there is a lot of noise. Becomes mess. Okay. So a noise as a, as a thing with a boundary, it has a beginning and an end. Okay. <clears throat> um, but a lot of noise is kind of ongoing. Okay. Um, now I said that uh, probably most nouns can be used as either mass or count. And even what you might think is your prototypical count noun, like cat, I mean, that is, a, that is a thing, bounded creature. Even a word like cat can be used as a mass noun. For example, there's a smell of cat in this room. A smell of cat. There's a cat smell. Right? And the next one, um, apologies to people who like cats. Um, after the accident... There was cat all over the road, all over the road. Right? So you drive over the cat in your car, and there's cat substance all over the road. And this is a typical sort of um, advertising slogan. More, you get more car for your dollar. In other words, this could be an advertising slogan for cars which are big, but not very expensive. So. So um, you get a lot of you you get a lot of car for your dollars, a lot of car space and substance for your dollar. Once again, car you would think well, car is a pretty prototypical count noun. It's clearly a thing, but here it's used as a kind of mass, a kind of substance. Right? Um, okay. Now there are some. Peculiar, um, you know, some idiomatic or idiosyncratic aspects, which are, you know, one possibly needs 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 to look at. Um, perhaps, uh, just a moment. Yes. Um, where are we? Yeah. The the uh, the final point. Um, s the status of something as count or mass is very often. Uh, well, in some cases, anyway, uh, an idiosyncratic, a peculiar feature of a particular language. Uh, one of the peculiarities of English is that the words news, advice, information, and research happen to be mess, which actually is conceptually very strange. Um, so, news... Um, Well, in, in other European languages, you know, French, German, and so on, the word for news is count. You have, um, well, the news consists of pieces, in, pieces of news. Information consists of pieces of information, and, uh, and, and so on. Now, the next thing I want to look at, where are we? Yes, um... Uh, in connection with the fact that um, you can often, yeah, the choice between count and mass is not a question of the actual objective properties of the scene, but actually the way in which you look at it and talk about it. For example, the first example here, the houses in the neighborhood versus the housing in the neighborhood. In both cases, you are talking about you know, the places where people live. And the meaning, I suppose, is more or less the same. But if you talk about the houses in the neighborhood, you are talking about the individual houses. But housing is a mass noun referring to, well, 
where people live. Right? It's, it's singular. And again, a, a workman uses tools where the focus is on the individual things, or you use equipment. Equipment would be a mess on for all the kinds of different things you need for a job. Um, now I want... Yes, now another thing I want to point out, and this is actually rather an interesting aspect of English. Uh, um, oh, okay, we've done count and mass. Count can be singular and plural, mass are singular. In English, actually, there's another group of nouns. It's quite a small group, although when you start looking for them, you find that there are quite a few. These are nouns which are always plural. Okay? A word like water is, or air is always singular. House can be singular or plural. You have a set of nouns which are always plural. They always have the S on the end. Um, these are sort of interesting. An example, well, here are some examples. Trousers is one of these in always plural nouns. You can't really talk about a trouser. So trousers, spectacles, groceries. You go to the store and buy some groceries. You can't buy a grocery. Right? And then there are expressions like odds and ends. You know, bits and pieces. R random things. You can't talk about an odd and an end. <laughs> it's odds and ends. Um, the premises. Do you, know this, do you know this expression? It's a sort of um, legalistic, bureaucratic expression meaning the building. Right? So you would say, um, no, no drinking allowed on the premises, on the building. Uh, so, so it means a kind of building and property and also perhaps the land associated with it. So the building premises or the, the office premises or whatever. Um, and this, is, and this always has to have the, the, the S on the end. You can't say, you know, the office premise. Well, the premises. Um, guts, you know, you're inside. Um, um, and innards also, your things inside, um, which are, well, actually you can use gut as a singular, but never mind. Innards, um, deadly always plural. Things like the whereabouts. I say, when you start looking for these, you find quite a few of them actually. Um, his whereabouts are unknown. Again, it's a fairly sort of bureaucratic, journalistic expression, you know. But it means his whereabouts are unknown, means simply, you don't know where he is. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, whereabouts with the S, and of course the plural verb, his whereabouts are unknown. You would use it perhaps, um, say, the police are looking for a suspect whose whereabouts are unknown. You don't know where the person is. Then there are certain uh, geographical expressions. The Alps. You can't have an Alp. The Himalayas and so on. Um, and expressions like the great outdoors. Okay. Um, interesting thing actually also when I say that these plural nouns don't have a singular, well, sometimes they do, but they mean something different. If you look here, the word movie and movies, <coughs> movies, well, that can mean two things. It can be the plural of movie, film. You see one movie, you see two movies, you, three, you see three of them. Okay? But if you go to the movies... What does it mean? It means go to the cinema. Right? So the movies does not mean a plural number of films. It means the cinema. Okay? Uh, another one would be dish and dishes. Well, you can say, well, dishes is the plural of dish. You have one dish, two dishes, 
three dishes. Okay? But what do you do after a meal? You have to wash the dishes. And what do you wash when you wash the dishes? Well, plates, cups, saucers, knives, forks, pots, pans, everything. So dishes in wash dishes is not just a number of dishes. Uh, it's, it means the kinds of things that you use for eating and cooking and which you have to wash afterwards. Um, and of course the machine that you do this with is then a dishwasher. So a dishwasher, which is not just for dishes. Well, it is for dishes in this sense. Um, another one is brain and brains. Okay. Brain as a mass, as a countdown, would refer to the actual, you know, <clears throat> the actual organ, the actual body part. Right? <coughs> Whenever I say to you, use your brains, um, I mean, use your intelligence. You know, use your intelligence. So, brain. Actually, I could also say use your brain. Um, but brains, as a plural, would be used in the sense of your know, intelligence, your mental abilities, mental capacities. Um, <clears throat> and as I say, once you start looking for these, there are lots of them. Account and accounts. Well, account as a countdown, an account, you give an account of something. In the sense of narrative, you tell a story. To give an account of something, well, you can give one account of something, two people can give two accounts of something. That's regular plural. But accounts, uh, if you keep the accounts of a business or a company, this is what an accountant does. It's, you know, Keep a list of the money, <laughs> income, expenses. Um, so that is what an accountant does. Um, also an example there, what does an accountant do? The, another word for accounts would be the books. A bookkeeper. A bookkeeper is somebody who keeps the books. And books is not what you find in the library. In the commercial sense, this would be you know, the accounts, a list of your income, a list of expenses. Okay? Now, oh, what's happening here? What do I do here? That's one, I, I suppose. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, so where are we? <clears throat> right, um, what what might be the conceptual basis for these plural nouns, these invariable plural nouns? Why do you have trousers? Why is trousers plural? Because there's only one piece of clothing. Um, in fact, of course, there's a... Um, there's a small a minor little system there in English, of course, is that those articles of clothing which cover the bottom half, the lower half of the body, and which separate the legs, <laughs> are plural, because there are two legs. Okay, trousers, pants, jeans, shorts, um, Bermudas, probably a few more as well. But of course, jacket, although there are two arms, <laughs> doesn't become plural. And then there are, okay, so, so there's a kind of two bits to them. And then there are um, objects with two symmetrical parts, like a pair of like glasses, binoculars, um, headphones, and so on. Um, groceries, well, groceries, plural, because there are if you buy groceries, there are lots of different 
ones of them, different kinds of things, and so on. So there is some sort of conceptual motivation here, although at the same time it has to be said that there is some idiomaticity. Um, just a moment, do I have... Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, um, plural nouns, yeah, actually in terms of their status as mass or count, probably these plural nouns are mass, okay, so, um, take a word like trousers, um, if you want to refer to one of them, you have to say a pair of, okay? Um, if you say, I bought some trousers, how many did I buy? You don't know. Um, if I bought some trousers, perhaps I bought only one pair. That sounds a bit strange. I, bought, I need to buy some trousers. It could be one pair only. It doesn't have to be two pairs. Okay. Um, I need some new glasses. I need some new glasses means this pair must be replaced. I need some new ones. It looks plural. Well, it is plural but it refers to only one. Or it could, well, it could refer to only one. Yes. Um, what is so interesting when you start looking for these, and as I say, there are quite a few of them, um, is that they actually tend to group together according to in certain semantic domains. For example, um, let's read this. A notable fact about plural, these nouns, is that they tend to cluster in certain semantic domains. Okay, one, one, one domain is the leg dividing clothing article. The so one such domain has to do with money um, and more generally things that you possess and things of value. Here are some wages, your earnings, means, as in the expression a person of means, a person with, a, with you know, wealth. Um, your expenses, your assets, right? um, effects, that's a rather technical term meaning again, uh, um, yeah, um, things of value, goods, um, goods and chattels, these are the things you possess, your riches, your savings, the takings, a shop has takings, money it takes. The proceeds, you sell something and there are proceeds. Um, the pickings, your belongings, even the word things. Where are my things? My possessions. Um, then another group is body parts which have a complex sort of structure. Guts, innards, intestines, brains, bowels, genitals, testicles. Quite a few have to do with locations, his whereabouts, the headquarters, the grounds, premises, the woods, forest, wetlands, uplands, the outskirts of the city, surroundings, then um, certain geographical places, the Midlands, Canterbury Plains, the great outdoors, plumb the depths, scale the heights, live out in the sticks, That's idiom meaning out in the country, away from cities. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, so let's press on. Time is it? Right. Okay, now, yes, uh, I'll finish in about 20, 25 minutes or so. Um, let's see, yes. Well, probably before. Okay, so I've spoken then about this. 
um, singular plural business. Um, I want to say a few words then about these topics here. Quantifiers. Uh, the quantifiers give some idea of quantity, amount, and extent of what it is that the noun is referring to. Um, um, so how long should I go on for? How, when, 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 when does the next class begin here? No, but I didn't. Okay, okay, right. Okay. Yeah. Because after about an hour, I think people are getting tired. I think after, after one hour of me talking, people are perhaps getting a little bit tired. Okay. Okay. Um, so, okay, I'll, I'll say, for sake of completeness, I'll say things about this category here, um, the quantifiers. Um, which is actually quite a complex system in English, um, because in a sense, each of the quantifiers actually has a grammar of its own. Um, a useful distinction is between absolute and relative. The absolute quantifiers um, okay, the, the, the absolute quantifiers simply give you some idea of how many. Um, such as all, a few, several, three, numerous, lots, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> relative quantifiers, okay, give you an idea of how many, but with respect to something. So the difference between most children and most of the children. So most children meaning, well, most children, <laughs> as a general statement about children, but most of the children, it presupposes that there is a set of children, and it's most of these. <coughs> three men, okay, any three men. The three men, definite, but three of the men is three out of this set of men. Um, and then there is the universal quantifier, this is, of course, all, all men. Um, <clears throat> it's a statement about, as I say, the whole category, which is actually different from the generic thing. Remember, cats are carnivores, a generic statement about cats are like this. If I say all cats are carnivores, this means one vegetarian cat makes that sentence untrue. Right? One exception is enough to make it untrue. So universal quantifiers are sort of about every single possible example. Um, okay, here's an example. Um, <clears throat> some of these differences. Three men entered the room. That would be absolute. Three. Three examples of the category men. The three men is definite. Three of the men, a set of men, and three of these. <coughs> Quite important also for the English noun phrase are these partitives. Well, three of the men, that you have the set of men and three is a part of that set. Things like most of the children, both of my children, half of the people or half the people and so on. Um, okay, I won't have much more to say here, but one interesting thing about, um, in connection with number, <clears throat> okay, if the subject is plural, the verb has to be plural. Subject is singular, verb has to be singular. We all know that. But, there are actually a few sort of exceptions. Well, I won't say exceptions, but it doesn't apply always like that. If you take the word family, singular, plural, singular. Okay. My family comes from, sorry, England, misprint. My family comes from England, but my family are all tall. My family are tall. Singular subject, plural verb. 
How come? Well, the reason clearly, if I say my family are tall, tall is a property of an individual. If I say my family are tall, I'm thinking of the individual people which make up the family. But if my family comes from England, um, that means my family as a, as a whole, as a set. The whole tribe comes from England, but the individuals my family are tall. And that would be an example where I think the example, the, the forms I've given here, I think would be just about obligatory. If you say my family come from England, my family come from England, that is very funny. My family is all tall. For me, that would be just wrong, actually. My family is all tall. All, of course, helps to make it plural as well. But then there are cases where actually you could go both ways. And I think there probably is a difference between basically British-based English and American English. I think Americans tend to be much stricter with the singular subject, singular <coughs> verb. So possibly, although one would have to test this, um, possibly Americans might prefer the police has arrested. I would say the police have arrested. Because the police, although it's singular, um, it consists of individuals. And what you're talking about here are individual officers who have done this. Um, quite clear, and the next one I think is probably quite clear, the United States has. The United States have declared, for me that would be very, very peculiar. The reason being that of course the United States, it is plural, but it refers to a single country. Um, and likewise, oh, what's been the matter with my typing here? Give Make it seven dollars, five dollars. Sorry, um, five dollars, five dollars is not enough. You couldn't say five dollars are not enough. That's what happens with spell checking, of course. It checks your spelling and replaces it with something that doesn't make sense. Uh, and clearly, five dollars. You are not referring to one, two, three, four, five individual dollars, but five dollars as an amount. That amount is not enough. Um, similarly, actually, with a lot of and a number of and a group of. If you say a lot of people, is that singular or plural? Well, there is disagreement. You can say a lot of people... Um, you're talking about a lot, and lot is singular. Then you, you, then you strictly should say, a lot of people has left, because a lot has. A lot is singular, therefore it's got to be has. Likewise, a number of suggestions, again you could say, a number has, that's singular. So, you could say, you really should say, a, a number has been made, a number of suggestions has been made. Like a group of children, a group was playing in the street. Um, but I've put question marks or even the asterisk against this because um, I think there will be a very good case for actually making it plural. Um, I would certainly make it plural. A number of suggestions have been made. Um, I think some people would say that is wrong and grammatical, but, you know. What has happened, of course, is that, although, strictly speaking, a number has been made, what has happened is that this expression, a number of, um, in fact, is simply being used as a quantifier, being some. So, a number of suggestions is actually plural. It refers to suggestions. And a number of is, um, well, simply a quantifier. Um, more technically speaking, a number of has become grammaticalized or grammaticized. It is no longer a number of suggestions, but 
a number of some suggestions. So, in fact, agreement then actually is, number of agreement actually is with this and not with this. Um, and I think actually this would be true for me um, even if that was omitted. So, how many suggestions have been made? How many suggestions were made? Oh, a number have been made. For me, that is, that is perfectly okay. A number have been made. Uh, even, I think, a lot have been made. A lot of suggestions. Uh, a lot of people have arrived. A lot have arrived. A lot have arrived. If you're talking about people. Right? How much money was made? A lot has been made, of course, because money is singular. Um, <clears throat> so something like a group, uh, a group were playing is okay, actually, I think. Um, so again, um, what, what this shows, I think, that the question of number agreement is actually driven actually by the by the semantics, actually, um, of the thing. Um, 